Psychosis, paralysis, and strokes. A study shows the new coronavirus could seriously damage the brain and central nervous system. Patient 7 reported visual hallucinations, seeing lions and monkeys in her house. Patient 17 developed a headache on her right side and her left hand went numb. Patient 11 had difficulty speaking, then she became disorientated and confused. Researchers are calling for more extensive studies to investigate the long-term risks for COVID-19 patients. Surviving the coronavirus is one thing, living with the consequences is another. For many who've suffered serious symptoms, rehabilitation poses its own challenges. DW's Nina Haza met a woman who's slowly getting back on the road to recovery. Faster, faster. And breathe. The lung test at the rehabilitation clinic is still exhausting for Dorota Danilovic. <laughs> this Berliner is a COVID-19 survivor. These are very positive results. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> Here at the Waldburg Zeil Clinic near Magdeburg, Dorota Danielovic is making great progress, although the past few weeks have been tough. In late May, she was admitted to hospital with bronchitis and a severe fever. An initial coronavirus test was negative. But after another test from her lungs, she was diagnosed with COVID-19 with severe pneumonia. An inexperienced doctor put her on a ventilator. It feels at first like water running into your lungs. I was terrified and feared for my life. I almost had a heart attack. My heart hurt for hours afterwards. I screamed and cried. I was in real trauma for several days afterwards. It's been six weeks since her diagnosis. She spent the last two here. There are strict protective measures in place at the clinic. Two people per table, you can't choose who you're eating with. Dorota Danielovic is one of a handful of ex-COVID-19 patients. The others here are recovering from cancer or surgery. Therapy here consists of physical exercise, breathing sessions and methods of relaxation. Dorota Danielovic spends a lot of time here on the cross trainer. Initially, she only managed three minutes. Now she can do 13. It's only been three days now that I haven't had to sleep so much and lie down during the day. There is this strange extreme tiredness after COVID that I hadn't been aware of. I just assumed that after a few days at the hospital, everything would be all right. Tiredness and a long-lasting loss of taste are typical symptoms after COVID-19. And... What's surprising for us is that the polyneuropathy, which is the damage done to the nerves during COVID-19, massively limits our patients' mobility. The psychological strain is also severe. They've survived a life-threatening disease, and they keep thinking about what could have happened. Dorota Danielovic spends a lot of time thinking about her father. He was in hospital with cancer and the coronavirus in the spring. She was only allowed to visit when he was dying. Two days after his death, she had the first symptoms herself and couldn't attend his funeral, something she discusses with her doctors here. What we have is time for our patients. That's something that acute care professionals just have very little time for these days. We can give our patients the time they need, we listen to their problems so that they can get these things off their chest. More and more former COVID-19 patients are being admitted to rehabilitation centers in Germany. Health insurance companies have started covering the costs to ease the pressure on hospitals. Dorota Danielovic is now immune and feels liberated. Just a few days ago, I laughed out loud for the first time. That's when I thought, oh, here I am again. I can laugh out loud and from the bottom of my heart, that wasn't possible for weeks. 
She plans to get her immunity tested regularly, but for now, she's looking forward to life after COVID-19. Neurologist Sarah Wiedhoff joins us. She specializes in neurodegenerative diseases. Explain to us exactly how the virus attacks the brain. Oh, you're starting off with a very difficult question that we as neurologists are all scratching our heads around. So I think it's fair to say that it's still very early in the era of neurological manifestations of COVID, and it really comes down to the unknowns of this virus. It has just been discovered that can it can have these devastating effects on the nervous system, really. And one theory is obviously that it enters via the nose or um, and then goes into the brain directly, and this would be a direct viral injury to the brain. Another theory might be that it's not so much the virus itself attacking the brain, but rather the immune system of the body trying to clear the virus in a healthy way and then going a little bit over the top and causing quite significant peri-inflammation and inflammation of the brain as an over over response of the immune system, really. Another mechanism um, that we have observed is um, targeting the stickiness of the blood. So it seems to be that a person severely affected with the COVID-19 virus is um, having an increased uh, propensity for the blood clotting. So this can obviously cause significant injury to the brain via stroke and mainly large vessel strokes. So these are just a couple of mechanisms. And I think there are several ones that we will really need to make sure that we will uncover them with future research. Zaha, I don't know if this question is just as hard, but I know a lot of people will be asking themselves, is the damage permanent? So I think here again, we have to distinguish which sort of brain damage it is we are talking about. And in a study we recently published and in our experience with these patients, it really comes down to the mechanism and to the early symptoms that people are reporting. So we have seen people that are getting on very well with neurological confusion syndromes or encephalopathy, as we as neurologists might call them. These people have a temporary dysfunction of the brain. And in our follow-up studies, they are able to clear this temporary dysfunction, this confusion um, and this delirium that they are having within a couple of days, really. So an impressive full recovery can be made. However, again, we have more severe cases where it comes down to the virus in an indirect way attacking via the blood vessel problem, the central nervous system causing strokes or the peripheral nerves calling something that we call Guillain-Barré syndrome. And again, here recovery takes way longer. It's quite a hard um, rehabilitation intensive pathway that the patients are usually stepping on. And again, it's too early to see what the long-term effects of those will be. And the fourth category of patients, the most severe ones potentially that we've observed, was these direct inflammatory severe changes in the brain. And here the outcome can potentially be fatal. Um, people can recover from it, but there is a higher likelihood that they will have a residual neurological deficit after recovery. Zara, lastly, and just briefly, what sort of patients are especially uh, affected in these cases? So we've seen the effects of COVID-19 on the brain in patients that had quite bad chest and multi-organ effects of the coronavirus. And we have seen this in these people as they needed to be intubated, fully ventilated. And as we weaned them off sedation and ventilation, we realized, oh, they are very slow to wake up. Um, and this is a potentially a secondary complication of their critical illness and of their long time on ITU. Interestingly enough, we have also seen the virus in people that were very, very mildly affected from a lung point of view and from another organ point of view. And they had only presented to hospital because of the severe neurological manifestation that the virus was triggering in those. So it seems to be quite unpredictable at the moment, and we can't yet really work out why some people who have a very mild lung um, respiratory illness then present a couple of days later into their illness, um, into a neurological hospital, presenting with severe weakness or difficulty uh, with consciousness levels or coma. Sarah Wiedhoff, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much.
Now more of your questions. Our correspondent Derek Williams is standing by to delve into the world of medical science. Assuming different COVID-19 vaccines are successful on different timelines, what is the possibility there will be multiple vaccines available within a certain country? The chances are, are quite high, actually. Um, there are over 150 different vaccine trials going on around the world, and, and over 30 of them are already in human trials, a few of them quite far advanced uh, down the road to approval. Um, they're also based on a number of, of different platform technologies, which will play a, a role in, in the crucial step of, of production when and if they're shown to be effective on a wide scale. Um, what are known as messenger RNA vaccines would be quite fast to produce, but, but the technology is still pretty cutting edge. It's so new that that if an mRNA vaccine is approved for COVID-19, it would be the first mRNA vaccine to be approved ever for, for a disease. Um, more tried and tested technologies that rely on, on small or inactivated doses of a pathogen or, or proteins that it carries, they take longer to produce at scale, but also um, we have more experience with them, making them in some ways more likely candidates uh, for fast approval. I think down the road, um, there's almost certain to be overlap from, from different vaccines in different places. 